I'm going to talk about money today. So if anyone needs to get up and leave, feel free to do so now. Um, and I'm going to tell you right from the start, my goal today is two things. For you to give more money. I don't care if it's this church. I've got plenty of places that are really great you can give. And secondly, um, actually I actually have three things. Secondly, that you'd understand the value that God has assigned giving in his kingdom. Thirdly, that you would actually get excited about it and learn to do it with a joyful heart. Not like churchy spiritual, like, oh, I guess I got to be joyful. Like, no, you get excited about giving because you understand biblically, like, the, the great things that God provides for us through it, the opportunity that he gives us in giving. Now, it's interesting, when we look at the whole topic of money, it's actually one of the things that's the greatest gauge of our spiritual maturity, biblically speaking. Jesus talks more about money than he does about heaven and hell. Why? Because for a lot of us, hopefully none in here, but for a lot of folks, money is actually the thing that keeps them from entering into heaven, from entering into a relationship with the creator of the universe who they're created to know, to love, and be loved by. There's the tragic story, a true story. It wasn't a parable that Jesus told of the rich young ruler. This was a young man who had it all, had lots of money, had esteem, had power in his community. He, he lacked nothing externally, but he lacked everything internally. He came to Jesus and he said, I've got it all. I've got money. I've got riches. I've got power. But the one thing I don't have, I'm pretty sure you can give me. How do I get eternal life? And you have to understand, it wasn't like the rich young ruler was saying, how can I make sure that when I die, I get to heaven? He wanted that. But he's like, how do I have life now? Because the way I'm living, even with all I have, I feel so empty inside. I have no peace of mind. How do I get that? Because I look at you and I look at your disciples and your followers and you seem to have nothing, but you seem to have everything. And Jesus told him how to do it. And it was the very thing. It was his riches, is what he had that actually kept him from real life. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. We're looking at Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And he's going to begin to dive into this topic of money. We dabbled in it a little bit last week when Jesus talked about uh, giving of alms and also prayer and fasting. But he's going to dive straight into it this week. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. He says, Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures... In a better place, he says, storm in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, meaning when your perception is good, when you're focused on the right things, eternal things, it says your whole body is going to be filled with light. You're going to experience life on the inside, peace of mind. But when your eye is unhealthy, when you're focused on the wrong things, when you're looking for life in the wrong places, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how many of you know people that describes them perfectly? The light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Jesus continues, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one, love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, when we talk about money today, I think it's really important for us to begin with acknowledging what Jesus' goal is for us and what Jesus' goal is not for us. And let's start with this. Jesus' goal is not to get your money. How many of y'all know that Jesus doesn't need your money. I mean, can we just stop being stupid for a second? If you really believe that God exists and that God is who he says he is, logically, where did we come to the conclusion that somehow God needs your money? This is Psalm 50, verse 10. For all the animals of the forest are mine, declares the Lord, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains, and all the animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, God says, I'm not going to tell you, for all the world is mine and everything in it. He's like, I have a buffet set before me every morning, every lunchtime, every evening, and if at any point I got hungry, 
I don't need to ask you to provide for me because it's all mine anyways. How many of y'all know that everything you have is not really yours? It's all God's. If it wasn't for him, you'd have nothing. But I work hard. How many of y'all know that there are people that work harder than you do yet have less? We're not as smart or as capable as we think we are. We're blessed. But it's all God's, right? Jesus' goal for us is really three things, at least that he expresses in this passage. Number one, he wants more treasure for you. Aren't you happy about that? And he wants a treasure of a superior quality for you. Here's the second thing Jesus wants for you. This is his goal. He wants your life to be filled with life. Or another way of saying it, peace of mind, true joy, true life. You guys ever met a person who's really wealthy and really miserable? It's such a lie that so many of us have bought into. If I just have more, I'll be happy. Typically, people that have more and don't have generosity, don't have giving in its proper place, are more miserable than ever before. Here's the third thing Jesus says he wants for us. This is his goal with the way we handle money. He says, I want you to have freedom from a cruel master. And that cruel master is money. Now, when we talk about giving and handling our money well, we have to understand that what motivates our generosity is not, number one, a guilty conscience. We don't get, oh, man, I sinned. I better write a check. Better Venmo the church real quick. That's not what this is about. It's not motivated by a desire to earn God's love or favor. Jesus earned God's love for you, his favor for you, fully and completely on the cross. Let me say it again. Fully and completely. Think about the thief on the cross. He's such a great example. He's a guy crucified next to Jesus. He was a thief, which means he stole money, didn't give it, right? And yet, because of Christ's sacrifice, like the guy that was right next to him, in that moment when he received Jesus by faith and said, hey, remember me when you come into your kingdom, the fullness of God's love, the fullness of God's favor was released upon his life. There wasn't much life left to live, but it was fully released. He had no ability in that moment to be generous with his money. He had none, right? It's the same thing for us. Like, desire to earn God's love or favor, that's not what motivates our generosity. Another thing is other people's opinions don't, doesn't motivate our generosity, For some of us, we're like, I'm going to give, but I'm going to let people know that I give so that people can think well of me. Or there's just peer pressure. That's not what the Bible says should be motivating our giving. What motivates our giving? Well, we love God, and we grow to love the opportunity to be part of what he's doing in the world. There's something that the Holy Spirit does inside of our hearts when we grab hold fully of the way that, that Jesus speaks about money, where we actually get excited We see opportunities around us that maybe we can't participate in fully or accomplish fully ourselves, but we go, I can give money to that. And now I get to become a part of what God's doing through another person or in another part of the world that I can't travel to. Is this making sense? I'm going to tell some stories that will illustrate this, but let's just talk about giving for a second. You know, when we talk about giving in generosity, when Jesus is talking about storing up your treasure in heaven, there's typically three things that we're talking about. And, and this is kind of speaking a little bit just from my personal life and, and my wife's and just kind of the way that we've handled money over the years. But there's three areas that we love just to give into. The first one is probably the most obvious one. It's the one that gets talked about most in church. And that's what's called the tithe. This is percentage giving. This is where you say, hey, the first 10% of everything that I make, and for me that's gross, not net, is right away you're just going to be given back to God. Now, when we talk about tithe, I look at it as my rent payment for breathing God's air and living on his planet. It's like, it's not really giving. Like, you can't categorize tithing as giving. (laughs) When God commands it and you're obedient, wow, I'm so generous. No, you're just doing what God told you to do. We have a saying around here, you're not generous until you hit 11%. Ten's just like the rent. It's just like God saying, hey, all of it's mine, 
and I'm going to give you 90, but I want 10 back, you know, right? So there's the tithe, and we'll talk about a little bit more what that does to our hearts and, and why God does it. But there's another area that we just love to give into, and that's missions around the world. To me, it's such a privilege to be able to sow into people and places that I'll never go to physically or personally, but I can be part of financially. I can actually sow into somebody else doing the work for me. How many are, are lazy? Right? Praise God. Actually, don't praise God for laziness. You know, some of us are like, oh, that's just too much work to go there, go there, whatever, or God's not calling you there. But you can take money, give it to someone who is going there, who is doing that work, and you get credit for it. And not just eternally, but in your heart, you go, I got to sow into something of eternal significance and value. It's this kind of this idea of if you can't go, then at least you can send. I have this deep conviction. I, I feel like part of what we're called to as the American church is to be the financial arm of the kingdom of God. You know, we struggle because here in Hawaii, everything's expensive. Breathing's expensive. I mean, like everything's expensive here. I call it a paradise tax. But even those of us that work two or three jobs, which I think I've done as long as I can remember, even those of us that are struggling, you have to recognize that you've got more ability and opportunity to make money than almost anybody else on this planet. And I go, okay, that's not by accident. That's by design. God has placed you, if you live in the States in one of the wealthiest nations on the planet with the most opportunity on the planet, I think for a purpose. And I think part of our privilege, you know, part of the design that God has given to us is to make a, i got to choose my words carefully, to make a junk load of money so that we can pour a lot of money into the kingdom of God. It was interesting, John Wesley was once quoted, he said, I've got three principles I live by when it comes to money. Principle number one, make as much money as I possibly can. Principle number two, save as much money as I possibly can. And he said, principle number three, I do the first two in order that I might give as much money as I possibly can. And if our minds shift and we go, wow, I've got this ability that not everyone has to make money, in order to sow into other areas of the kingdom that maybe I can't touch physically, but I can send someone else who can. How many of y'all have heard of a guy named Humphrey Monmouth? Exactly. How many of you have heard a man by the name of William Tyndale? Several of you. William Tyndale was the first person to translate the Bible into English. It had been translated from Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic into Latin, which was the translation that was essentially used by the priests in the 1500s, but none of the common people spoke it. And so it was like the Bible was trapped in a language that nobody could access, you know, get access to. And Tyndale had this call upon his life from God to translate uh, the Latin Vulgate, the Latin version of the Bible, into in- English to be able to send it back to, to England so that the common man could come to know the God of the Bible. The only problem was it was against the law. You could get arrested for translating Scripture. You could be burned at the stake for translating Scripture. Tyndale fled England, and he had this desire, I want to translate the Bible, I want to translate the Bible. He connected with a very rich merchant, a guy named Humphrey Monmouth. Now, Monmouth decided to fund Tyndale's translation of the, of the Bible into English. And he did it in a couple of ways. One of the things that he did was gave him physical protection. He also provided for him financially, but not only that, he used his own merchant ships to ship back hundreds and thousands of copies of the English Bible back into England. Now, all of us have access to the English Bible, And actually, we have hundreds of translations we get to look at now. We all should be thanking William Tyndale, but we all should be thanking William Monmouth, too. And I love the beauty of this partnership. Here's Tyndale. I have this gift and this passion 
to translate. Like, I'm great with languages. And mom was like, that's great. I'm terrible with languages, but I'm great at making money. Loads of it. And they're like, let's partner together for the kingdom. Mama said, I can do what I can do and put money in its proper perspective. You do what you can do and let's partner together. Who gets credit for it? Who gets the joy and the excitement of knowing that scripture is now in the hands of the common man? Both of them. Both of them. It's what, it's what we're talking about. We get the opportunity to sow into places that maybe we, we couldn't do ourselves but we partner with someone who can. Is that making sense? Now, there's a third area that, that I think is so important for us to give into, and it's something I just love, and that's giving to the poor. You know, one of the things that Sarah and I do is, you know, each month we've got different categories of giving, and one of the things that we do is we just, we just give to the poor. And we do it in a couple of different ways. One of the ways that we do it is, is more structured, where we're giving to different organizations that specifically are just helping the poor, uh, in, in different parts of the world. Now, these would be things like Compassion International, Otinawa, which is an orphanage we support in Uganda, different things. But one of the other things that I always try to keep, and, and i got to be honest, I'm a little jaded, so this part's a little bit more difficult for me. But the other thing is I try to make sure that I, that I also keep my heart open to giving to the poor that are right in front of me. Right? Like, we don't want to just pay somebody else to give money to the poor for us. Or another way of saying it is we don't want to just pay somebody else to be compassionate on our behalf. I think it's really important for us to love what Jesus loves and he loves the poor. And so one of the ways we can do that is to make sure that we've got interaction with the poor. And that as we you know, enter into this joy of giving, that we're actually giving not just to organizations that are taking care of the poor, which I'm all for, but also that we're going, okay, Lord, Where's your someone that I can bless? Who needs money right now? Who, who in our church family, who outside the church family is just struggling? And it's just an opportunity for me to bless them. Now, when we talk about giving, Jesus says that we're accomplishing some things. What is it that we're accomplishing? The first thing that he says is that we're actually storing up treasure in heaven. But he says we're not just storing, he says we're actually steering as well. He says we're storing up treasure in heaven, but we're also steering the direction of our hearts. Let me read to you again verse 19. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Here's the steering. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Jesus says, hey, I want you to have treasure, but I want you to have treasure of a superior quality. So don't store it up here, store it up in heaven. How do we store it in heaven? We give. There's a story of a wealthy businessman during uh, the Civil War, and and through his travels, he'd accumulated a lot of, of Confederate currency. And as the war was coming to an end, it became clear to him that the North was going to win, and at the moment that they did, all of his Confederate currency was going to be worth absolutely nothing. So he had a choice. What do I do with all this? It's worth something now, but what am I going to do with it? And so he did what any sane person would do. He began to trade it. Trade it for good. Trade it for U.S. currency. He kept just enough to supply his needs in the moment and the rest he traded. It's such a picture of what, you know, the position we're in. Jesus is like, hey, <laughs> the war ends, you know, the war's gonna end soon. I'm returning. You have the opportunity to keep something that's gonna lose its value very quickly, or you can invest it in such a way by giving it away. We're actually storing up treasures for yourself in heaven. Now, here's what I love. It's not like Jesus is being super spiritual or pleading emotionally with us when he's saying, store up your treasures in heaven. He's being purely logical. He's saying, hey, do you want treasure that's just going to fade away? Or do you want something that's going to last for eternity? Don't you love that? Some of us, I talked about this last week, we have such a struggle with, no, 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 I'm just doing it for Jesus. It's not for the rewards. 
And Jesus is like, well, there's plenty of rewards. Do you want them? Maybe I'm selfish. I want them. Jesus says not only do we store up treasures, but we actually are steering our hearts. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. This to me is such a wonderful promise that God gives us. How many of you see certain areas of your heart where you just see selfishness? Or you see areas of your heart where you don't quite love the things that God loves yet? You know, maybe for you it's the poor. And you're like, I just don't have compassion for them. If I'm honest, I could just care less. Jesus says there's a really simple solution to that. It's called money. This is amazing to me. Jesus says you can do a physical act that will actually change the feelings of your heart. He says when you give money to the things that God loves, even before you actually love them, it's going to redirect and steer your heart to begin to love the things that God loves. He says, wherever your treasures are, there the desires of your heart will be also. Notice the order. The order is so important. He says, you want to begin to treasure things that God treasures? So into it. I don't really care about missions. Lord. I, just, I, don't know. I know I should. I want to, but I don't begin sowing into it. And I'm just amazed, like, this is such an easy thing. How cool that all I have to do is write a check or give online, and then my heart becomes more like Jesus's. I don't know about you, but, like, that seems a lot easier than fasting, a lot easier than, like, spending hours in prayer and intercession Maybe I'm just carnal, but I'm like, you mean I can just write a check and my heart's going to change? Yes, yeah, sign me up for that. <laughs> is it just me? I'm like, this is a no-brainer. I want to love what you love. I want to hate what you hate. And if I can accomplish that in part by treasuring the things, by storing my treasure, by putting my treasure in places that actually matter, let's go. Let, let's sign me up for that. Now, here's the second thing that Jesus says is accomplished when we give, he says we're actually choosing our master. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, there's a couple important things to notice here. First off, notice that Jesus does not say that you have the option of having no master. This is how a lot of us live. <laughs> I'm in charge of my life. I'm in charge of my money. Nobody's master over me. Really? Jesus says you basically have two options. You can be God's slave, and he uses the term bond servant, and then Jesus would go on and say, no longer do I call you servant or slave, but now I call you friend. It's the kind of master I want. He says, or you can be enslaved to money, and a whole host of other things. But Jesus doesn't say there's a third option of, well, I'm just in charge of my life. Paul will say it like this in Romans 6. He says, anytime we sin, we actually become enslaved to that sin. And all of us, we've felt that. We've experienced that. Where you feel like there's just this one thing that feels like it's got control of me. I don't have control of it. Now, the other thing to notice that I think is so important is Jesus says... If we're devoted to anything other than God, if there's something else in our life or an area of our life that becomes master over us, look at the way that it affects our relationship and our affection with God. It says you're actually going to love one and hate the other. There's going to be a part of your heart that is set against God that's actually going to be begin to despise God. Why is that? Anytime we're mastered by something, it's what the Bible calls idolatry. You know, you look at the Old Testament and there's you know, a lot of discussion about idolatry and, and idols were physical things that they'd set up. Whenever they worshiped an idol, they became mastered by it and it began to control their life. And historically, as you look at the way that, that God's people interacted with idols over, or, you know, over the centuries, Anytime a prophet would come and say, hey, God wants you to have freedom. 
He doesn't want you to be mastered by this thing. He doesn't want you to be worshiping something that's not real. Worship the true God. They would explode in anger and rage, and they're killing the prophets, and they're doing all these things. Why? Because God's beginning to poke at the thing that they love most, the thing that they idolize. Some of you have done this with relationships. You're dating someone. You can be even married to someone and you idolize them in such a way where if anybody begins to poke at that, you explode. We can do these with things, possessions. We can obviously do this with money. And what Jesus says is when it's master over you, you begin to idolize it. And when God comes in and starts poking at it and saying, hey, this is bondage, not freedom, that part of your life actually begins to hate him says, no, don't take this thing away from me. This is making sense. You ever felt that about a certain area of your life before? And God so lovingly and tenderly is like, hey, son, daughter, I want you to be free. You can't have two masters, and you can't be master of your own self. I want you to choose me. And remember, Jesus' goal in getting you to give is that you choose the right master and to keep you free from the cruel master of wealth and money. Solomon's a great example of this. King Solomon, the wealthiest man that ever lived, the wisest man that ever lived. Solomon was so good at making money that for the nation of Israel, silver became almost worthless. You're like, I've got 2,000 pounds of silver. And they'd be like, so what? I got 2,000 pounds of dirt in my front yard. Big deal. Like nobody cared. It was gold. But even that, everybody had gold. Like the wealth was unimaginable. You had the Queen of Sheba that came to visit Solomon, and she's famous for her wealth. And she was speechless. I've never seen anything like this before in my life. He had it all, and he became mastered by it. And he wrote a book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes, where he said, life is meaningless, meaningless. For some of you, you're like, oh, I don't care about money, it's sex. He had all that too, 700 wives, 300 concubines. He got to the end of it, and he said, it's meaningless, meaningless. He had the cruel master of money. He had the cruel master of sex. He had the cruel master of idolatry. And it led to one place, death, not life. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. And Jesus is like, I want to spare you the pain of having a cruel master. And you go, okay, how? How, Lord? How do I do it? He says, give. Give. Now, I think there's one particular type of giving more than any other of the three that we talked about that really helps you decide who your master is going to be, and that's percentage giving. And the reason is that percentage giving has everything to do with control and trust. And when you're talking about having a master, your master's in control and you're not, right? And if you're talking about having a, you know, a good master, God is your master. God is the one who's in charge of your life. He's inviting you into a place of trusting him and trusting that he knows better than you do in all things. And so when we talk about how do I choose which master, there's one thing biblically and one thing experientially for my life that has is, that is kind of set that you know, decision in stone, so to speak, and it's percentage giving. It's the tithe. It's one of those things where, you know, like I said, Sarah and I, every bit of money that we get in, I don't care what the source is, every bit of money that we get in, except maybe birthday presents. Maybe if I was really spiritual, I'd tithe off of birthday presents. But every source of income that we get in, the first thing that we do is give 10% right off the bat. And the reason we do it is so that money is not master over us. The reason we do it is because we're automatically releasing it back to God. God, this is yours. And it's interesting, you know, so many people say, well, I can't afford to tithe. And I go, I can't afford not to tithe. Because you have to understand when you give, percentage give, what you're doing is relinquishing control and also ultimate responsibility for your finances into the hands of God. You're saying, hey, in this act of obedience, I'm declaring, not just with my words, but with my wallet, that God, you're ultimately in control, and that God, ultimately, you've got the responsibility to provide for me and my family. 
How many of y'all think that God is better at being in control than you are? How many of y'all believe that God is better at providing than you are? Remember, he said, hey, if I'm hungry, I don't need you to make me a sandwich. I got it all. I'm telling you guys, this is logic, not just emotions. But our emotions get entangled with it. Because for a lot of us, we've made money an idol in our life. And it feels scary to let go of it. But if you're going to choose who your master is, I, I can't, there's no other way, guys. There's just no other way, percentage giving. You're saying, Jesus, I trust you. Sarah and I have had moments in our life where it's been like really lean. And tithing hurts. We're like, do you know what we could do with that 10%? It wouldn't just be rice and beans and peanut butter and jelly this month. You know, like, we've been there. But again, it's a question of, do you trust God as your provider? Do you want to be under the cruel master of money with the illusion that you're in control, or do you want to live in reality and say, God, you're in control. You're my provider. I want you to be in charge. Jesus says, you get to choose. That's, that's the amazing thing. Jesus has set up his universe in such a way where he says, there's two options you get to choose. You get to choose. You have the power to choose which master you're going to serve. Who's going to be in control? Who's going to be the one with the ultimate responsibility to provide for you? I'm going to tell one quick story and then we'll end. There was a man that Jesus met, a guy who was a tax collector. He was the opposite of generous in all respects. He cheated the poor. He didn't give to the poor. He could care less about people. All he cared about was himself. He idolized money and was in you know, its grip completely. And one day he encounters Jesus and has a meal with Jesus. Jesus doesn't say anything about money. Jesus just says, hey, I'm willing to spend time with you. And it was the time that Jesus spent, the affection, the attention, the friendship that Jesus handed to a guy who was essentially a God-hater and a traitor to his own people that radically shifted his heart. And as he encountered the love of Jesus, his natural response was to give. The guy's name was Zacchaeus. A lot of you know the story. In Luke chapter 19, verse 8, it says, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I'm going to give half of my wealth to the poor, percentage giving. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I'm going to give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Zacchaeus was so lost and he didn't know, but the moment he came into contact with true life, with true peace of mind, the Prince of Peace, he realized it and he said, oh my gosh, I've been enslaved my whole life. He said, today I'm choosing a new master and it's Jesus. Was it him giving his money that saved him? Absolutely not. The giving was a response to the salvation he received from Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave. And when we receive what God has given, our natural response is to do likewise. I just want to encourage us, guys, I want us to be the most generous church on our entire island. I want us to be the most generous church family. I want us to have this excitement of like, wait, I can be like a monument? Like there's maybe things that I can sow into to see the kingdom of God expand and the furtherance of his gospel? You mean I can steer the direction of my heart by giving money? Sign me up. And I said this at the beginning, I'll say it again. I don't care if you give here. Biblically, if this is your church home, I think you should, and hopefully you do it, not because you feel like your arm's twisted, but because you actually believe in what we as a church family are doing for the kingdom, for this community. But if it's a stumbling block... Go to pathministries.com. They do amazing things, and they're planting hundreds of churches in northern Uganda and in Ethiopia now. They're taking care of orphans and the poor. Incredible ministry. We love them. Send me an email. I'll send you a list of 10 different places that you can give your money to. I'm so happy for that. Just give.
just give. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you that salvation doesn't just come to our spirit and soul, but it comes to our finances. Thank you that you free us from the cruel master, Lord. Thank you that your desire, Lord, is that we do have treasures, but real ones, ones that are going to last, ones that we're going to be so much more satisfied with. And Father, I just pray, give us eyes, give us hearts to see just the worth, the value of the treasures that we can be storing up in heaven. Lord, help us to see the worth and the value of the lives that are going to be changed and saved because we're sowing into missions around the world, because we're giving to the poor, because we're doing the things that you've called us to do. Father, we're so grateful for the way that you provide for us, and we're so grateful that you've invited us into a relationship where we can relinquish control, where you can be in charge, where the burden can be lifted from our shoulders, and we can just recognize you as our ultimate provider. And Father, I just pray that for our family, that our church family would just walk in that freedom, that fear, that control, that greed would not have any claim on us, that we could just walk in the joy and the freedom of giving. And I pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen.